All right, so it's 12 o'clock. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here um, on this Thursday, uh, June 25th, 2020, here at noon central time. We've got a really nice panel uh, for y'all today talking about ornamentals and landscape. A bunch of different questions. Really pleased with the amount of questions we got. Some very uh, intellectual questions. It's uh, very good. We're going to have some, a very good, a good time here today. I want to note that outside today we're dealing with a little haze. So y'all may be seeing that dust from the Sahara Desert that's come, come by. Kind of obscuring the sky is interesting. It's supposed to have good sunsets though. So keep a watch out for that tonight. But with that, uh, for, I want to introduce our panelists today. We'll start uh, above to my left with Sheila Dunning. Sheila, tell us a quick bit about yourself um, and just say hey to the group. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm the commercial horticulture agent in Okaloosa County. I've been there uh, just short of the 22 year mark and um, we've been having uh, lots of experiences with pest control guys and landscapers because that's my primary uh, uh, audience. But uh, all you homeowners also, I, I, I can help you solve some of your plant problems because I've spent most of my time in the nursery industry prior to extension. Yeah, over the last 20 something years, there's a few more landscapes in Okaloosa and Walton counties than there used to be, I would guess. Oh yes, yes, Just yes. Just a few. All right, Matt Lawler up to my right. He's Matt's joined us before, so I'll get him to do a quick introduction. Hey, I'm Matt Lawler. I'm the Santa Rosa County commercial horticulture agent. Um, so I work uh, my primary my primary <laughs> clientele are landscapers and farmers, so just about Very anything. Good. Yeah, there's no, I don't think there's any of us that are extremely specific in what we do, which makes it interesting. Stephen, this our newcomer, Stephen Greer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for involving me in the group. Um, I'm looking forward yeah. to the conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm the county extension director in Santa Rosa County. So Matt and I work together. Uh, my background is horticulture and turf grass management. And to give you Excellent. a little detail, just slight. Um, basically came through uh, uh, a certain university north of here. It's Clemson University. And oh, that's okay. Uh, started out at Augusta National and uh, decided I wanted to go into extension work. So it worked out real well. And I uh, uh, finished up in North Carolina and um, a little local closer to it, I was a horticulturalist with St. Joe Company with several of the developments in South Walton and involved in watercolor, water sound, and Windmark Beach. And uh, that was nice. a fun adventure, I will yeah, say. Water, watercolor may come up later in the conversation, I have a feeling. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, was, um, Augusta National, by far the most beautiful golf course I've ever set foot on. So good. It job. was. Quite enjoyable. Was all, that was all you. Quite enjoyable. L nice little 85 an hour week job. No, no issues. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt the way it looks was all due to Stephen's work. So, Matt, or what? By yourself. Oh, hello. Uh, well, my claim to fame is being the physical embodiment of the family guy character Peter Griffin. Besides oh, that, <laughs> is, besides that is I, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I've been in extension for uh, nine and a half years. And my specialty areas are peach production, um, fruit trees and roses, but I can, I work really well with any type of horticulture from commercial to home lawns. So I'm here to answer your questions today. Yep. That's Washington County, Florida is where I'm, I'm at, Chipley. Yep, big city of Chipley. So we also have with us Julie McConnell helping moderate over on Facebook um, and keeping us in line today. And uh, Beth Bowles uh, is gonna help us moderate the chat um, and she's probably gonna chime in a, at a couple of times. So. She's the agent in Escambia County Horticulture Agent. So we've got a really good uh, pan group of panelists for you. I uh, want to point out the sign behind me. Give a sh quick shout out to my wife. Did a really good job writing backwards this morning. Uh, I wrote it the correct way, and you could not read it. It was, it was backwards. So we wrote it backwards, and now you can read it. So shout out to her. All right, let's get going. Um, we're going to first start talking about some plant selections within our ornamental and landscape categories here. So how do we pick plants and what plants do we pick? And our first question is coming for us via Zoom, and it's going to be for Matt or Watt. Matt, are there, what recommendations do you have uh, for what to plant as a privacy screen between my yard and the street? And we got a bunch of questions on this, so people are obviously in interested in their privacy these days, and they don't want a fence, they want to plant. So tell us some options of things we could do here. 
I believe you're muted, Matt. Take your mute off for me, please. Thank you. That's a thank you, Daniel. I'm I'm honored to answer that question. Thank you very much. There's lots of great answers to that, so I'm just going to focus on a few. But let me uh, later on. We're going to post the Florida Friendly Landscape Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design, and that's a good place to start. But before we do that, uh, I have two links that that Matt Lawler is going to share with you um, in the background on the chat. And the first one is Walter's viburnum. Walter's viburnum is a native plant of Florida and it makes a great addition to the landscape. It can grow to 20 feet tall, but you can choose dwarf forms. It's evergreen and thick, and it can be a small tree or a hedge. And it produces uh, lots of small white flowers in the spring. And it's a favorite nesting site for cardinals and other songbirds. Yeah. So it can tolerate drought tolerant and can tolerate a range of soil soil types it, it does sucker and so those might need to be pruned but it is a good plant the next one is not a native but it's not invasive either it's the podocarpus also known as the yew and there are many different cultivars of podocarpus out there that can be used as a screen hedge uh, in a variety of soils especially the the sandy soils it's japanese yew it's native to southern china and japan and it is a great plant for this area uh, to act as a screen plant and it's fairly fast growing and evergreen so and that's one you can shear and it likes to be sheared. sheared. Yeah. So if you if you're into a native landscape Walter's viburnum if you want the more manicured look uh, Japanese yew podocarpus and there are lots of others that I could talk on this for an hour so I'm just gonna let you check out the landscape selector guide when that gets posted later posted later on. Yeah I would echo what Matt said on that um, Florida Friendly Guide to Landscape Selection and Design. If you could only have, I would say if you could only have one resource for ornamentals in Florida, that would be it as far as picking plants go. So definitely check that out. I have some personal experience with that, uh, with that Walters Viburnum. I have the, the dwarf cultivar world class as kind of an informal between uh, myself and my neighbor. Um, you know, it's got to about five feet in height. So, I mean, it's not a, a huge screen, but definitely, definitely a nice looking little native. So good job there. I, I agree with that. Um, kind of along those lines, just some, uh, could you give us just some general um, ornamentals that are evergreen, uh, not necessarily for a screen, but just for, you know, that four season interest, just throw a couple out. Oh yeah. The, you know what? Uh, so right now Lawler's going to post that, uh, Matt Lawler's going to post that guide, that uh, plant selecting guide. I have it on the spreadsheet, but I would suggest uh, camellias for winter color. And there's some new, some of the dwarf camellias like Shisha Gahara and some of those others are really good or, Sasanqua for the fall bloom, Camellia Sasanqua, and those Camellia japonicas are really good as evergreens. Um, I also like uh, for evergreen ornamentals, you know, your, um, you know, this is pretty darn evergreen is for shady, half sun or some shade, but also full sun too, if you have enough uh, mulch, is the Vaccinium Darrowi, the Darrow's blueberry. Mm -hmm. or, uh, it's an ornamental dwarf blueberry that produces a lot of really beautiful uh, blue new growth in the spring. It sheds leaves in the, 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 the uh, late winter um, and they turn red to, to shed, but it also has an evergreen leaf. It produces little edible blueberries that are also also ornamental. So I would suggest, uh, you know, the, the camellias, the blueberries, they're just, just wonderful. And some of the native azaleas are also really nice. Uh, there's lots of plants. So, but that selector guide, I would suggest looking at that selector guide and you'll have a a huge amount of plants you could look at for that. Very nice. So we'll move to our next question. This is a Zoom question for Miss Sheila Dunning, Okaloosa County. So Sheila, they asked, what is a good native ground cover for a sunny position in a small flower bed? Like most of us, they have sandy soil. So what do you, what would you uh, suggest for this person? Well, and if you're truly needing it to be native and a solid ground cover, so very close to the ground, um, you may want to look at frog fruit or lyre leaf sage. Yeah. Uh, the sage will, it is a salvia, so it will have a spike type bloom, which will make it a little bit taller, but when it's not in flower, it's very close to the ground. Yeah, I like uh, the that. The frog fruit is actually creeping instead of a clumper that spreads out. And it too has a very small flower. Both of these are good attractants uh, for our pollinators, um, as well as some of our um, other, like the hummingbirds for the salvia, for the yeah. lyre stage. And lyre as in L-Y-R-E, 
increment if you go looking it up, okay? So it's also an honest salvia. Yeah, <laughs> but you may also consider if it doesn't need to uh, keep all of its foliage all the time, there are lots of really good perennials. Uh, Gallardia, tick seed, which is our yeah. Coryopsis, our native wildflower. Um, there's a lot of these very short spreading plants that will fill in as a ground cover, um, but bloom a whole lot longer with larger flowers to them. Yeah. I have included uh, the floridayards.org website, and if you mm -hmm. haven't done that, um, that is a pretty good option to give you some starting points. Yeah. It is interactive, so you can define your parameters and it'll generate you a list. So in addition to that landscape design, you may want to try this interactive. It's a bit more limited, so it didn't come up with some of those things that I just mentioned, um, but it is good starting point also. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like most of the peop uh, most of the ground covers that uh, we think of being out there, you know, like uh, some of the annual stuff like the blue days and then Asiatic jasmine and even perennial peanut, none of these are native. Um, so that's a, that's good. So uh, she gave you some really good native options there. I've grown a number of those. And, some and if it's not small, if it's actually a fairly large right. bed, right. then look at the sunshine mimosa. True. Uh, but it is a very aggressive grower. Yeah. So it will take up a large space. Right. Uh, but very reliable, very sand and drought tolerant and still a good bloom. But by you saying small, I assume you didn't want it to creep too far in this one. Right. Definition. Well, I guess depending on the definition, the sunshine mimosa is short, but not small, I would say. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I grew that that thing once in, inside a concrete area and it, uh, it actually ran under the concrete and through the cracks into another bed. So I can vouch for the aggressiveness of uh, buyer beware on sunshine mimosa. Cool plant, but man, is it aggressive. That's, yeah. that's so awesome. the weed or frog fruit, both common names for the same thing. Yeah. Or even the liar leaf sa sage would be really good options to keep in a limited space. Good deal. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. And can I add one thing that on the liar leaf sure. um, sage, there has, a, we've had some come up it just as a native plant, just wild in our area here that have been mm -hmm. great host plants to ladybug larva. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to have some uh, some liar leaf salvia in your natural areas anyway, so might as well put a few in the flower bed. Uh, so Stephen Greer, his first ever question on gardening in the Panhandle Live here. It's a big moment yeah. for you, Stephen. <laughs> uh, so this question comes to us from our, our uh, Zoom subscribers. I want to hear about shade producers. Like, So I, I assume we're talking about plants that make shade, so get big enough to make a little shade, like chase trees or vitex. Uh, and bottle brush trees, so instead of crepe myrtle. So evidently they're burned out on crepe myrtle and want some alternatives for a small shade tree. So what you got? Uh, crepe myrtle, crepe myrtle really has been around for quite a while and it's kind of become that southern staple. And yeah. uh, people see it everywhere. One thing exactly. good about it, if it's run over out in the middle of a road, it, it tends to grow back, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's tough. But uh, um, when you're you're looking at, I'll, I'll first address those those two that are listed in there, the chase tree um that that's been around gosh for quite some time they're all all three of these mentioned in here are introductions um they're they're not native plant material but um you're looking at the chase tree it's it, it's grown for that that flower a lot of people like to see in the course of leaf shape and those things but bear in mind with it it's going to get to 10 to 15 by 15 wide maybe 20 wide um it has kind of that single trunk look at the base and it has a breakout and you it looks like a multi-trunk tree so it gives yeah. some nice character, but what you have to be aware of, it will reseed all under itself in that yeah. compost and mulch area, and you wind up with an invasive process, and uh, you, your neighbors may not appreciate you very much. So, you know, just be aware when you're using it. Yeah. Um, the bottle brush, in terms of shade production, it's really not going to produce a whole lot of shade for you. It's it's an interesting character with the bloom and that that slight burgundy pinkish color with the uh, the way the, the floral design or shape goes up is really nice. But um, if you're looking at other things, you may want to look in somewhere in the maple families as well. There's a lot of small mid-sized maples out there that, that you can use. Um, I like the Florida maple. Now it gets a little bit larger. It's going to go to 25 to 30 feet tall by 25 feet wide, but it gives a nice little shade piece for you. 
Okay. And if you're looking for something in the oak family, maybe consider sand live oak, the Corcus geminata, is, yeah. as it's, it has more of a cup leaf and it has a, a, a real interesting character of the trunk and the way the limbs kind of almost corkscrew a little bit for you. So it, it yeah. creates a, a unique look in the yard and it won't get it, quite it as may big. Get, it may get big, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, yeah, you and I won't see it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other side of it is very salt tolerant as well because yep, it leaves out sure. late. Yeah, those are awesome. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So we've got sure. some options there. If you've got a sandier yard, you may look at a sand live oak. Um, if you've got a little heavier soil, a little more inland, you know, check yep. out those smaller maples. Yeah, uh, really good. So if you're burned out on crepe myrtles, there's some options for you. And uh, I had a master gardener in Walton County uh, when I was over there that was actually allergic to crepe myrtles. So. Oh. This will be good wow. for you. Thank you. All right, so Matt Waller, uh, we have a question uh, from Facebook. What type of plants would be good for small areas? So I saw that question and I thought, well, that's just an easy answer. I can say yeah. all dwarf varieties. <laughs> yeah. um, but you'll see one of the articles that Beth is gonna post uh, is dwarfs aren't always dwarfing. Um, and you'll notice that you might have to, to prune dwarf plants quite a right. bit in order to keep them to that small size. Um, there's a, another little publication that's uh, got some tables with some plants and plant sizes that Beth's going to post uh, to maybe help you out a little bit. But just what came to my mind um, when it comes to dwarf varieties of plants, uh, there's some nice dwarf loripetalums. Uh, there's even some some ground cover types that might not always be a ground cover, so you might need to kind of keep them under the control as well. Um, I thought about Indian hawthorns, and then there's a number of dwarf azaleas, um, and I won't steal all the rose thunder, but uh, <laughs> there's some drift rose varieties that might be interesting to check out for a small space. Um, I think other than that, you know, ground covers, uh, Sheila kind of covered that, and uh, we'll probably hit on those a little bit more. And there was a publication that was our plant selection guide that you can go to and kind of say what your scenario is, and it'll let you pick out what works best. Yeah, I, you might have noticed, I'm sure you've noticed this too when you go to nurseries these days, and a lot of these, um, these new series of plants like um, Gardener's Confidence, First Edition, Southern Living, there are all of these older species of plants and just dwarf cultivars. So I guess there's a rise in small landscapes and people wanting small plants. So there's mm -hmm. a ton of options out there. That's good, real good. Um, so we're actually gonna go to, this is a question that's very specific to Escambia County. So we're gonna go to uh, our Escambia agent here, Beth Bowles. Um, we're looking for a nursery that carries pineapple guava. An excellent, excellent plant, I might add, uh, in Escambia County. So do you have any any suggestions for a shopper in Escambia County looking for a pineapple guava? I do. That is a wonderful shrub. I mean, it's kind of an underutilized shrub, although you need space for pineapple guava. It does get very wide as well. But you can look locally at Pensacola Seed and Garden. I just gave them a ring on the phone and they have it. Uh, also floral tree. And then if you yep. visit some of our, our large retail nurseries, there's a new dwarf available. Uh, I think it's Bambina. Uh, Sheila or Daniel helped me out uh, with that one, but that's something if you don't want the big size of pineapple guava, you're going to get a nice selection that stays a little bit smaller. That's a yeah. Southern Living introduction. Nice. So yeah, that's a great plant. Um, one of my favorites. My dad's had a hedge of it for a long time. Really, really tough. So if you're in Pensacola, check out, uh, what was the first one? Pensacola Seed and Garden? That's correct. Pensacola Seed and Garden. There's two locations and then Floral Tree Gardens as well. Right, and Floral Tree is up on um, Pine Forest, is that correct? It is, north of the interstate. There you go. All right, very good. I, I, I like to stop at Floral Tree when I'm in the area. It's convenient to uh, uh, my in-law's house, so nice little stop there. All right, Matt Orwat, a Zoom question for us. Is there a list available showing seasonal blooming and colors of flowers? So do we have a, do we have a, a, a resource that's sort of a chart for this? You know what I, I say? You know that, that selector guy that I talked about earlier and I guess I, Beth will I know we that. hate yeah I know we hate to keep going back to that but it's, it's really so good I mean <laughs> yeah. you can just find a look at the color it has charts for color you can in that little box you can look for color and when it blooms and all but if you wanted to so that's a resource 
that you can go to, but if you want a lot of nice color in the summer, uh, I love my go-to for summer color is Rudbeckia and Echinacea. The, the Echinacea is the purple coneflower and Rudbeckia is the, the, uh, ye uh, the yellow coneflower and those, both of those species are wonderful. You can get the native wildflowers and there are a lot of new cultivars out that don't reseed as well as the natives, I, I would say, but they produce a lot of amazing colors. Yeah. And so if you just want some nice color in the heat that withstands the, the summer heat, uh, you can't really beat those two species and the new selections for variety of color in your landscape in the summer. Yeah, I agree. I would say check out that uh, Florida friendly landscaping, um, landscape design uh, book, really good. And, and, and uh, I'll shout out Vitex too. Like we talked about Chase Tree and, and Vitex, mm -hmm. but there's some dwarf cultivars of those two. They really right. produce a lot of color in the summer. For sure. And then, as always, call your local extension agent. They're going to be able to, all of us here are going to be pretty good at um, being able to help you with that, that sort of thing. And a final one would be uh, some of these, these independent, especially uh, independent garden centers, have some really knowledgeable folks that work at them. Um, and so be sure to check that out and use those folks, folks as a resource. So Yeah, I totally agree. Your local garden yeah. center is an amazing resource. It really is. So... We're going to move on to our next question from uh, our Zoom listeners. This is for Ms. Sheila Dunning. So Sheila, hi, I'm new to the area and would like to learn more about palm trees. Thank you. So I know in South Walton and South Okaloosa County, you see a palm tree or two every now and then. So uh, <laughs> give, us well, the, give us the two minute crash course on palm trees for the panhandle. Well, uh, realize that in the panhandle, um, the only true native one we've got is a needle palm. Right. And that is a very short, plant that uh, prefers to be in the shade. So when we start thinking about all the palm trees, most of these are either naturalized from another part of Florida or have been introduced. So Florida's state tree, the sable palm or cabbage palm, is probably the most cost effective and fairly easy uh, to afford and get into your landscape. Availability is not bad. Um, but everybody is after that Florida tropical, which is more of a Mediterranean look. So right. we do see a lot of the Phoenix, which is like your Canary Islands, your Medjools, your Sylvester's, Phoenix right. being Venus. Those are a lot of the introduced ones. So keep in mind, we still have some really cold winters every once in a while. Yeah. Last being 2014. Ooh, but 14 was rough for our palms. <laughs> 14 was rough on palms. Yeah. So if you're introducing some of these Mediterranean species, which yes, they're from the desert, they can take cold nights, but they can't take freezing for extended periods of time. Um, yeah. So the foliage gets damaged, the trunk potentially could have some damage. Um, so really pay attention to those they are very costly yeah uh, they are very heavy so in mm -hmm. transport um but certainly refer to our edis publications on palm selection because there are lots and lots of varieties definitely choose those that are meant for north florida we're not going to grow bismarcks and coconut palms and that sort of thing up here in the panhandle for more no than queens months. and royals no queens and royals. Sorry, guys. Okay. So do, do keep that in mind that cold is a factor for these. But yeah. the most important thing is realizing when they are installed, this is a grass-like plant and it likes to root when the soil is warm. So April through August is your palm planting time, not okay. fall and winter like we do our woody plants and planting depth matters. For they sure. do not want to be installed any deeper than they were originally dug. And these will all be bald and burlap type plants. Very few of them are gonna come in containers unless you start very young. And you right. can get, like the pindo palms, the windmills, yeah. you can get those in containers. So if you wanna start young, you certainly can on some of those. Yeah. Look at how much space you've got. Look at those factors with your cold and then make your selection, but lots of listings there. Um, it hasn't been posted yet, 
but yesterday there was a webinar on palm selection um, and it should be posted to the Florida Friendly Landscaping webinar site um, very soon, you know, like before this week's over. Right. So there is an option. I don't know. We can include that later. Okay. Well, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. That's about as comprehensive and quick a palm guide as you can get that two minutes from Sheila right there. So very <laughs> appreciate that, Sheila. Well, otherwise, you can attend palm school, which is two and a half days, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, palms palms are very nuanced. You know, there it's it's not a tree, so we're gonna you're gonna have to kind of you know check what you know about planting trees and shrubs at the door. You know, when you grow palms, so it's an it's an interesting thing. Uh, and if you decide to get into it, check out those those uh, resources that we're gonna post. And all, again, call your extension agents. We're all fairly familiar with palms. All right, thanks, Sheila. So Matthew Orwat from a Zoom question. Uh, this person says the best plants for full afternoon sun, um, I guess on the west side of a house, especially for beds around the house foundation. So probably a small okay. area, maybe a couple of feet wide normally, maybe six, eight feet. Perfect. Of, uh, and it's going to be hot, you know, with that heat bouncing hot. off. So what oh, yeah, that's going to be hot and it's going to be a lot of, uh, it'll be a pretty high pH because you're right next to the foundation. So that's it'll, it'll probably tick up the pH a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, what can we um, do there? Well, there's uh, there's lots of things that can be done, but I'm going to just focus on four of them. Okay. Uh, the first one I'll focus on is the dwarf yopon holly. Okay. I know it's used a lot, and it you find it the you find the full size one all over our woods because uh, uh, because it just grows everywhere. It's native, but the dwarf selections of the yopon holly are really nice for a low planting around your foundation. They're easy to maintain. They're drought tolerant. They're heat tolerant. They're they're just all around tolerant to everything. You could throw at it. Um, here's one, another one that might work if you have really well-drained soil is a lavender, if you wanted to plant lavender there. However, the soil must be well-drained and you have to water it, but also let it dry out a little bit in between waterings. If you're willing to treat it correctly, lavender will do well, but if the soil is not well-drained, it will just die. Right. Um, another one that is a native of South Florida, not North Florida, but South Florida, but it grows fine here. It dies to the ground every year, but it comes back and produces a really good look for around the house is the Pamelia patens, the fire bush. It can withstand heat. It can withstand, uh, it flowers, uh, show, has showy flowers, attracts hummingbirds. Yep. So if you don't mind something that dies to the ground in the winter, I would say that's great. And there's a dwarf, Pamelia uh, patens variety, Glabra is the dwarf. And uh, it can, um, and, fi and firefly is another one. Uh, and another one is compacta. Those can can do really well, and and be and be uh, very nice around the house. And the last one I'll talk about uh, that uh, was mentioned before is the Vitex or the Chase tree. Now that one you wouldn't want to plant the full size one, but there's some dwarf ones out there I've seen at various nurseries that uh, can make a really nice planting around the foundation. And there's uh, uh, there's pink, white, and purple cultivars. They bloom in the summer and they can withstand some brutal brutal heat in the afternoon with afternoon sun. So I would, uh, I would definitely give those a try. Uh, if you mulch really well, I don't think you'll have some issues with the seeds coming up, but you need to keep in keep that in mind when you plant, you don't want to neglect it and let a bunch of seeds come up in the bed. But um, one thing I do with Vitex, I highly recommend when I grew these back in Texas is, is I grew a, a hedge of Vitex and the thing to do is when they flower, just deadhead them. It's a little extra work, but go by and deadhead and cut the old flowers off, and you're going to get rebloom. They yeah. will not. They will rebloom, and then when those bloom, deadhead them again. Just keep after that about once or twice a month, and you can have bloom all the way to the frost, and you won't get the seeds. So that's good option. Win win. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate Anything else that. you want to add to that, Daniel? Yeah, yeah uh, the only thing that I, or I mean, obviously there's a ton of plants out there. Those are some really good options. One thing that I've been planting a lot uh, around foundations especially that get a lot of sun are uh, ornamental grasses. And Sheila's seen a ton of that. All you have, in the, especially in the, the newer developments, they take, you know, like Bacahatchee grass, muley grass, uh, cord grass. Some of these, I mean, they just take the heat amazingly well um, and, and can do full sun. So I would, you know, check out ornamental grasses also. Um, so thank you, Matt. And we're going to move on to our next question. Uh, we're going to ask Sheila Dunning. Uh, this is a Zoom question. So Sheila, uh, I know over the last 20 years or so, there's been an awful lot of Indian hawthorn planted and we're starting to see 
not starting, there's major problems with a lot of these plantings. So what are some substitutes for Indian hawthorn as a foundation planting? Uh, the client would prefer to use native plants if possible. Well, and we've already mentioned the top two. If you're okay. sticking to natives, and I'm assuming you're saying Indian hawthorn because you also yes. want to bloom. Right. Uh, so the top two would be that dwarf Walter's viburnum, very compact plant with a white bloom. So similar growth habits to the Indian hawthorn. They um, bloom around similar times too, don't they? They, I'm sorry again? Sim, they bloom similar times of the year also, yes, correct? they do. They are both spring bloomers. So yep. um, there is not a pink phase like there is in the Indian hawthorn. There's True. pink cultivars, but there are not in the Walters viburnum yet. Right. Uh, but the other is that Darawai blueberry. Uh, okay. very, you know, very compact plant again, but good color, both with the foliage, the bloom, and then the added bonus of actually an edible, colorful little blueberry. Um, yeah. So if you're sticking to natives and, and still need that color in the compact form, those two are really good choices. Um, if you go outside of the natives, um, then, you know, Matt mentioned a few things, but you can certainly also look at a lot of your compact hollies that in the Japanese hollies, there's soft touch, there's uh, Bordeaux, there's, you know, many of these right. other hollies that you're not going to get the bloom, but you do have that very compact form to it also. If you are set on any hawthorn, definitely look at resistant varieties. Um, Olivia in white and Eleanor Tabor in pink, but realize most of the problem with that Indian hawthorn is it is a plant that requires full sun and very little moisture on the foliage and you can have success with it as long as it stays in the sun and you don't have overhead irrigation. But um, unfortunately that's, we're seeing it put everywhere and those lead to those problems. So yeah, maybe one of those two natives that uh, can take those conditions would do better for you. And I, th I think now with this question is a really good time to mention that regardless of if you're planting native plants, the plant uh, non-natives we've talked about, um, just try to have a, as diverse a landscape as possible. These, these huge monocultures, these massive hedges of these plants, when you get a problem like the Indian hawthorns have had with a leaf spot, it can just wipe out an entire landscape. So be as diverse as possible. Would you agree with that, Sheila? Oh, absolutely. And that is the problem we've seen with the Indian hawthorn. It runs from sun to shade. Yeah. And there's not 10 of them. There's 20, 30, 40 of them. Yep. And when it comes to a disease, it doesn't have a hard time finding the next most vulnerable plant when we do that to ourselves. Right. That's, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so a, a quick bit of housekeeping. We Several of us have mentioned the word deadheading. Um, and we've had a couple of questions on that in the chat. We'll go ahead and clear that up. Deadheading just means removing. Uh, old flowers um, and that promotes can promote new flowering uh, on plants that do that so uh, that's what we mean by deadheading just cutting off old flowers all right um, we're gonna move on here Matt Orwat told me that he had an answer to this question we'll, we'll see what he's got uh, this is from zoom looking for perennial shade plants uh, that might support beneficial insects and amphibians so it's either gonna need to hold water or grow near water I suppose to, to do this um, and uh, the other panelists, once Matt has, has given us his thoughts, y'all feel free to weigh in on this one quickly. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say, if you want something to hold water, some of these bromeliad species are perennial, and they love the shade, and they can grow, um, and, and they can actually hold water, and little frogs can, amphibians can live inside those things. Yeah. So, and, and something for, for shade, you know, you can grow some of these uh, native, native understory trees. There's just a whole bunch of native understory trees, like buckeye that can grow and, and some of these uh, native understory trees, and there's a whole list of them out there. Talk to your native nursery that hosts butterfly larva. So I would suggest okay. like toothache tree. I saw a bunch of butterfly larva on a toothache tree one time. Interesting, yeah. There's, there's a lot of things you could do there. So Matt Lawler, we have a Zoom question. Is there a best variety of lavender? We talked about lavender a little bit earlier, earlier on here, for a heat tolerant plant, but what is the best variety that can tolerate our rainy summer season? Okay, um, so I would recommend reading an excellent article uh, that Beth is going to post for us, and it was written by one of her master gardeners, uh, Carol Perryman, uh, and it talks about five different varieties uh, and species of lavender, 
Um, it lists Spanish, French, um, and then one in particular is a variety called Anominal. And that's one that, that I've seen growing um, at a lavender farm. Believe it or not, we do have a lavender farm in Florida. Um, it's right on the Washington Bay County line, mm -hmm. um, almost right off the interstate. And that's the variety they grow. It's uh, just called Phenomenal, and it's a, it's a cross variety. Um, you know, normally, because we do have a hot and humid climate, I wouldn't recommend lavender at all. Um, but if you're able to keep the plants the, the root system dry, so you, you keep the, keep get like drip irrigation to them in a sandier soil, then they're probably gonna do all right. Um, and the other important thing that you need to know is that in order to promote flowers, you know, we've talked about deadheading a lot, but lavender prefer to be sheared um, and you kind of just keep them to a mound shape. Um, so you would do that in winter time to promote the uh, flowering of those plants. Yeah. Um, it's still going to be a, a struggle to grow <laughs> lavender. Um, nothing's easy. Um, the two that I've seen are the French and then that phenomenal variety that have done well here. Yeah, and uh, I, I'll echo Matt on that. The uh, the lavender farm we've been to is in about as good a lavender growing conditions for the panhandle as you could have. I mean, it is the ter it's terrible soil. <laughs> There's no shade. Um, and then they even take some additional steps, right, to keep it hot and dry. Oh, well, yes, they, they actually um, put down a landscape fabric and right. then they just plant, they have planting holes within that fabric and that helps uh, keep the root system moist uh, without getting moisture on the plant. And then it also keeps the area around the plant a lot hotter because it's a black fabric yes. um, that's uh, absorbing that heat. Uh, you know, throughout the year. So it can be done, but it's not easy. That's what we're getting, getting at here. Uh, it's a phenomenal in that French are the two, two varieties Matt recommends. So very good. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up this plant selection uh, section on talking about some, some of our favorite ornamental plants and some of our least favorite. So the question from Zoom is, uh, please give your top 10 ornamental plants and your bottom 10. Um, in the bottom 10, uh, we're gonna select them for plants that are prone to insects and disease uh, in North Florida. So we'll start with Sheila. Sheila, give us a couple of your favorites and then a couple of your least favorites. Okay, and we Tell have- Tell us why quickly, I guess. Okay. We haven't brought them up a whole lot at this point, um, but Cliera and uh, the cultivated viburnums, not just the natives, but Cliera, if anybody remembers the old red top and it got diseases and, okay, this is a similar look to it, but a much more compact, uh, glossier leaf to it. So Cliera will make an excellent hedge or a tall foundation plant. And nice. virtually nothing bothers it. It's, it's pretty good with salt. It's excellent with uh, drought, but no pest or disease issues associated with it. In the viburnums, we've touched on the natives, but don't forget about a couple of the cultivated. Um, our sweet viburnums, our sandanqua viburnums, Again, tall hedge material to small tree if you limb it up. Um, they can have a little bit of a water demand when a first being installed and have to get good consistent watering to get yeah. established. But after that, not much is gonna impact them. Um, if you had any issues at all, it would be nutritional. I feel like they grow so fast. <laughs> that would be the reason they need that water to start with. Yes, exactly. But yeah. again, also a good bloomer and dark, dense foliage. So work really good for screenings. Good choices. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Big problems. You know, we've already talked about the Indian hawthorn and the Animasporium leaf spot. Mm -hmm. It is the right plant in the right place if it's full hot sun. If it is not, you are going to constantly deal with disease. Yeah. So that's what makes it a problem. It, it's not that the plant is weak itself. It's simply the way that it's utilized in the landscape. Um, and we haven't touched on it yet, but sago palms, the same situation. They now are highly susceptible to an exotic pest. And what used to be a no maintenance plant has now become extremely high maintenance yeah. year round in order to keep 
this scale insect from really devastating your plants. So sagos now are something that's being discouraged in the landscape um, because of those kind of problems. All right, that's good. Uh, two good ones, two, two not as good ones. Can be good in the right situations, I guess. Uh, Matt Lawler, give us a couple good and not so good, in your opinion. Um, so good plants for disease. Well, so my favorite plant is probably like a Florida anise um, okay, or yellow nice. anise. Yeah. Um, they do well in shady and sunny conditions, and um, they seem to be fairly, fairly tolerant of most disease issues and insect issues. Um, one that uh, Sheila's already mentioned, but um, Indian hawthorn, you know, it, it's pretty tough. It just gets a lot of leaf spots and, and things that, um, you know, are a little bit unsightly throughout the year. Right. Those would be my two thoughts. Okay. Matt Orwatt, can you give us a plant that, that does really good and, and maybe one or two that just struggle a little bit and we, we can do better? Uh, you need to unmute your mic again, Matt. I apologize. Hey, thank you. Um, I like the coneflowers. The Rebecca and the Echinacea are both really good. Um, I also love the disease-resistant roses uh, that have been released recently from Cordes, K-O-R-D-E-S, out of Germany. There's some new ones like... Uh, Beverly, Wedding Bells, and Tupelo Honey. And of okay. course, some of our old garden shrub roses like Belinda's Dream and Madame Antone Mari. I love those. Uh, and so those are the top two for me uh, for our, our landscape. But for the bottom, I would say if you have some roses that are extremely disease prone, they can be at the bottom of, of what I would plant. Unless you're a rose fanatic that will spray religiously and you're a rose enthusiast. But if you're not a rose enthusiast, stay away from disease prone roses. And another thing I would not recommend here, a couple more, are peonies, lilacs, Bradford pear, and Japanese privets. Nice. Uh, peonies and lilacs are just too hot here. They won't do well. Uh, Bradford pear can be invasive if they cross with native, with, uh, with, uh, with wild pear that are uh, naturalized, and they split in the, the, in, with uh, high winds, and the invasive privets are a no-no. That's a no-no. So we, Stephen uh, has been back, bouncing back and forth on us. If he can uh, get back on, we'll, we'll get, let him weigh in. But uh, I'll give you a couple here for, for me. Um, I really have enjoyed the, the new Chinese Mahonias, uh, the soft caress, especially a dwarf cultivar. If you have any shade whatsoever, it's an excellent little, uh, little plant. Gets three or four feet high, no maintenance, no pest and disease. Really enjoyed that. Um, and every year I have some uh, Madagascar periwinkles, uh, also known as vincas. That's a really nice annual little plant. It reseeds a little bit. Sometimes it can be a bit of an aggravation with the reseeding, but it's so dang pretty, and they just don't have a lot of problems if they're in a hot, sunny spot. Um, and then a couple that I just don't recommend anymore, beautiful old southern plants, but the dogwood, our flowering dogwoods, are, are just really disease prone at this point um, and are very difficult to grow. We can, you can do better. Um, and then gardenias, everybody loves the way they smell, but feels like every insect in the world loves those things from white flies to scales to, to all kinds of stuff. So I, I try to steer people away from dogwoods and gardenias when I can. So, all right. Thank you guys. Steven, real quick, if, since we've got you back here for a second, give us a plant that, that you, uh, you do recommend and the one that you're not recommending at the moment. Yeah, I had to move to the other side of the building. <laughs> Everything <laughs> just froze on the other side. Um, I, now, it's a large plant. In most situations, I, I, and it may have already been mentioned, but I do not like the Magnolia Grandiflora just by the fact oh, yeah. that it's southern nature and the way it blooms and those mm -hmm. things. Um, the D.D. Blanchard, the uh, and one that's unique, kind of more salt tolerant, the Claudia Wanamaker. It's it's a real neat thing to actually see it growing up against dune areas and continuing yeah. to be successful. Um, but uh, another one, it's a hard one to find it, it. It's actually fallen out of favor because it doesn't bloom or you might get one bloom on the whole plant, but it's a great hedge plant and it's Athena. And it's, uh, um, okay. I've grown that in a couple of landscapes and it, it goes up to that 15 to 20 feet tall by about eight feet wide. And it really creates a nice density. Okay, so those are but, magnolia cultivars that are all, all really good depending on where you are, very good. Right. Um, in terms of the ones I always struggle with is anything lantana, just because of the way it seeds and moves and pops in all over the place. Um, yeah. Extremely drought tolerant. That's the good thing yeah. about the plant. And it'll bloom for you. It'll take a beating and keep on ticking. And, but uh, um, 
it, it tends to show up um, a lot of places you don't want to, like literally right next to a telephone pole where a bird visited. Yeah, so those are good. If you're going to plant lantana, I agree with Stephen, try to seek out those uh, those sterile cultivars so you don't yep. have bleeding problems. Lantana is a horrible invasive in a lot of Florida, so just keep that in mind and plant sterile varieties if you're going to grow that. So agree. move on to some general plant care and maintenance here. We'll run through these. Uh, Matt or what? Our rose man. Uh, this is a Zoom question. Can you prune the old knockout roses now and expect them to come back before October? And co by come back, I assume we mean flower. Okay. I'm yes. I'm gonna. There, I'm gonna touch on this real fast, but there are a couple considerations. The first one I would say to consider is that if you're planting, uh, there's a great link there that talks about pruning roses. But the best time to prune roses is February 1st here in Florida, in North Florida, February 1st. But uh, if you have knockouts that you want to stimulate, what you should be doing is as they bloom through their flushes, after the flush is over, I'm going to go back to deadheading. Cutting off your old blooms acts as pruning because you cut it back to the first five leaf leaflet that's facing outward. That takes some of the height down. It reblooms. You keep, keep deadheading. Keep doing that. Now, in, what you should do in February 1st is cut out old canes and old wood. So what I highly recommend is if you have a healthy knockout plant with some old wood is don't cut everything down all at once. Pick the oldest cane you've got that's the least productive and cut it to the ground. And the rest uh, cut back by one fourth and that should be good. If you have a really bad plant that's really leggy right now and you need to do some pruning, you can do a uh, moderate pruning on it in the summer and you will get a fall rebloom, but don't go too crazy because it'll stress the plant out in the summer. Right. Um, just, just from a little personal experience, I've uh, had some knockout roses that help my folks with. And uh, after a flowering, he'll take the, my dad will take the head shears to it and just a light shear just to knock those old flower heads off. And like you said, that does promote, yeah. promote a little more flowering, but. That's another good idea if you have a lot of plants and don't want to be, be uh, take the time, shearing is fine. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. But the short, long answer is all of those things. The short answer is yes, it's possible. <laughs> so, the, the only thing I'd like to add is make sure the shear is sharp. So there you go. Spread. That's true. Yeah. Cause some more problems. Oh, um, let me add one more thing. Make sure the yes. shears have not been used all over the place and yep. disinfected because you don't want to spread crown gall. Always, always a good practice. So Matt Lawler, we have a question here from Zoom. Uh, do you, in keeping um, or pruning a large gangly oleander? Uh, if so, uh, how would you suggest taking control of it knowing the poison danger of the plant? So try to break that one down for us. Okay, well, we'll address the poison danger first. So okay. oleander does have, you know, a milky sap um, that can get on your skin. Um, and if you ingest it, you're definitely not going to be happy. Um, so uh, it's just important that you take special measures. Uh, make sure you're wearing gloves um, when you're when you're pruning. If you do choose to prune that oleander, uh, my two thoughts on what to do with it. You know, I, and I can imagine it's just getting kind of leggy and it's not not providing um, the screen that you want anymore, um, or maybe it just looks unsightly. Um, so. Uh, the good thing about oleander is they put up all sorts of different sprouts um, coming from their base. Um, so you're, you're not generally going to have a problem if you just go and, and knock them down pretty close to the ground um, and just allow that new growth to come up. Uh, the other thought, and I, I just found this when I was researching, you know, what okay. to do with this oleander. Um, the publication from our EDIS site um, has a really nice picture of a tree form oleander. Really? Uh, where they've just, uh, you know, that one came from a nursery. Uh, it's just a standard tree, uh, mm -hmm. but you could go in. You'd have to keep knocking the little shoots down over time at the base, but you could go in and um, just cut it back to one trunk um, and then maybe tip prune um, to the top of the tree um, and allow new shoots to form at the top and, and get a nice, nice oleander tree out of it. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Got a couple options there. Very good. So, Stephen, we got a couple of questions here on uh, on hydrangeas. Uh, I'm just going to kind of get you to answer them together. So, okay. The first one was tips for oak leaf hydrangeas, and then the second, how can you be successful growing hydrangeas? So, uh, just kind of combine those as best you can. So, just okay. To, I'll just kind of ramble through it. How about yeah. that? 
Just okay. some general hydrangea growing tips for the panhandle. Yeah, um, when you're looking at most hydrangeas, they they like that partial to full shade in this setting. They're they're definitely an understory plant. They they like that morning sun, kind of that peak of that early sunrise and things, but they don't like it during the hot time of the day. So you want to make sure that shade's showing up around that 10, 10, 30 time period and staying on it for the remainder of the day so you don't have the damage. They do like a lot of organic amendments into the soil. They, they, they like the moisture, but they don't like wet. Um, if you've got the sands or clays, you're, you're looking at compost materials, the small pine bark finds, mixing it in. Uh, typically, if I'm going into a new soil setting and working, I'm looking at adding about two inch layer of that type of compost, tilling it into that top five or six inches or more, just to get that, that stabilization in there for that moisture content. Um, but, you, you know, you're, you'll see most people growing the macrophylla, you know, that snowball and some of those large leaf varieties and things that we typically have in the sure. area. And you're big blue flowers. flowers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, just look at those. Now, once in a while, you'll see a PG hydrangea, you know, more of the, yeah. the small shrub, or, or, or I actually will grow into a large shrub form and nice bloom flower. And uh, But that's that's kind of a an old-fashioned one where you, you really have to hunt around for it. Um, okay. That takes some extra pruning in it as well, because you will have some stem tissue you'll have to remove after three or four years just to, to keep it stimulating, looking good and clean. Gotcha. So you're, tell, you're telling us we need uh, afternoon shade, uh, some, some ba a good soil with some organic material and- Well-drained, well-drained. Well-drained, but moist. Yes, <laughs> yes. You like that trick? Yeah, it's, it's that perfect soil we're looking for. <laughs> All right, so good deal. You can grow hydrangeas a lot. I mean, it's a common plant. A lot of them are done really well. They just need a little shade, some good soil and a little moisture. Um, so Sheila, this is a, an email question that we got. Is July too late to fertilize camellias and azaleas? No, it is not. The plant okay. does need to recover from all the energy that was spent on all that flowering. And That's it has true. to make it through into the fall months. However, uh, you will not use the same rate that you did in the spring. Okay. Um, so they do need acid fertilizers that are usually complete with the phosphate level a little bit low, and they do need minor elements. But where you might have used, oh, upwards of a pound per 100 square feet in the spring to push all that new growth out, you will not use that rate now. Cut okay. that in half, a quarter to a half a pound, so that that plant does not go into the fall and winter months starving. So yeah. you will do fertilize, but reduce your application rate. What's most important is that you don't prune at that time. Okay. The concern is that? is that everybody knows that azalea buds for next year are set on that wood over those summer months. And so if you over fertilize or you prune, you are taking away next spring's azalea blooms, or in the case of camellias, that winter's blooms. So yes, unfortunately in our sandy soil, we still need to keep it fed. Just reduce your rates, okay? And make sure it is something for those acid loving plants, but put the pruners up, you're done. If you haven't done it by now, it's too late. Makes sense to me, I appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna come back to you, Sheila. So we've got a question about rabbits. So how to keep rabbits from eating my lily leaves? You got any options on that? <laughs> well, and it depends on how you want to approach this. Um, the standard answer would be a fence, okay? Yeah. Um, two foot high, slightly buried, uh, hardware cloth to small chicken wire, something that they couldn't get through, obviously. Um, right. But aesthetically, that might be a big issue for you. Yeah. So take into mind the normal rabbit's habit. And they are big sniffers. Everybody recognizes the twitching of the bunny's nose, right? So anything that would irritate that would deter them. You will see on the bag of blood meal, a bunny rabbit, okay? And that's because it is a natural deterrent for rabbits. And it's not because of the nitrogen that's in there, it's the talcum powder that it's within. And okay. it really does dry out their nose and irritates them but everybody's going to have to learn. So if you've got more than one rabbit coming, 
you may have to reapply constantly. And if you're using bone meal, that or blood meal, excuse me, that would mean you'd be over fertilizing your plant. Okay. So you may want to look at some of the other products um, that contain the capsaicin or other peppers in okay. a form. Um, and again, they'll have to keep learning these things. Uh, so you'll have to reapply, but fencing would be ideal. If you can't do it, use the talcum based either pepper or blood meal type product. And hopefully you don't have a giant family there that's going to have to learn this. There you go. By the time they it, the damage, you know, is done on the plant and you have to wait for it to grow back. Right. That's a tough, tough problem, but you just got to keep after it. Matt Lawler, uh, we're going to go to another Zoom question, shift gears a little bit. Should you cut the seed pods off uh, Lily of the Nile, uh, another name for Agapanthus, after they bloom? And when uh, should you transplant and fertilize? Okay. Uh, so when I looked at this question, I, I thought we could take it two different ways. Okay. Um, so, you know, I thought they're either asking uh, about removing the seed pods, either to try to promote more flowering or this person was asking because the seed pods are flopping over and it looks a little unsightly on the plants. Okay. Um, so the answer is it's not going to hurt anything to remove those seed pods after flower. Um, it's probably not going to promote any flowering on this particular plant. Um, when it comes to transplanting, um, so agapanthus are, have a clumping growth habit, so they are going to kind of just take over whatever. Um, it's important that, you know, after flowering, so in the, the winter months, you can go in and, and just divide those plants out, dig them out, and then replant them in another place in your, your garden. Um, the important thing with them is, is and my other thought was maybe this person is having trouble getting the plants to flower at all. Um, they need to be in a sunny spot. So any, any place in the shade, sure, they'll look beautiful. They'll have nice foliage, but they're probably not going to flower very well. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it's, it seems like the longer you leave agapanthus alone in one spot, the better they bloom. So, yep. so very good. If you don't have to transplant them, maybe just leave them alone. Uh, we'll come back to you, Matt. Um, okay. There's t two questions here that are very similar, so I'll just get you to kind of tackle them together. Um, one is just the primary cause of leaf yellowing, and the second one's a bit more specific. Uh, my rows of Sharon leaves are pale yellow. My soil is also sandy. Do I need to fertilize? So just, just tell us quickly what causes leaves to yellow, um, and then should we fertilize this rose at Sharon? So leaf, leaves yellow in all sorts of different fashions, um, and they they yellow on different spots in the plant depending on what nutrient is deficient. Uh, of course, it could be other things like disease and insects as well. Uh, but my, my first thought would be uh, it's important to get a soil test um, so go ahead and send a sample off and get full analysis, um, not only to see what the pH is, uh, but also to see what nutrients are needed in that plant. So it just might be, um, it could be either the pH is off, um, maybe the plant's not able to take up iron um, or nitrogen very well, um, or in some cases you might need to fertilize. Um, generally, uh, the two most common leaf yellowing causes would be uh, the top newer leaves um, are going to turn yellow. It might be an iron deficiency. A lot of times that's related to your pH. Um, and then the other would be if it's lower leaves um, throughout the plant, then it might be a nitrogen deficiency if it's just gotcha. a complete yellow of that leaf. So yeah, that's good. Uh, nutrient deficiencies often do cause that leaf yellowing. So. Um, Let's see, uh, we're gonna to move to Matt Orwat here. Matt, make it quick, we're running All out. right. What advice do you have for growing gladiolas in the park? All right, gladioli, the gladiola species, glads. Uh, well, they like to grow in full sun and they like to be um, in moist, well-drained soil like you'd find in a vegetable garden. Okay. Uh, you plant the corms three to six inches deep and it can be in a single row, but if you have multiple rows, they're 20 to 36 inches apart on in the rows, and you can space the corms at only two to three inches apart. Um, for fertilization, uh, you could use a low number fertilizer like 888 or 51010 or something like that that's balanced. 
and it should be applied at three to four pounds per hundred square feet when the plants uh, are six to eight inches tall as they come up. And again, when the flower spikes appear, you do not need to fertilize heavy if you just planted them because it will burn. So I'm talking about when they're in the ground. Um, and sometimes, especially if they're really tall gladioles, you need to stake the flowers or they'll flop over in storms and break. So yeah. staking is important. Um, and mulching to keep down weeds. So uh, if, if you trim off the old blooms, you'll probably get some new blooms. Uh, and a lot of old varieties will grow around old home sites and such. And you can find some vintage, beautiful uh, gladiola. Um, there's not a really good publication for Florida, but I found one from Clemson University. And, and so the one from uh, Clemson, uh, Clemson University in South Carolina, that's a really good uh, publication that's gonna be in the chat for you. Yep, and uh, real quick, I'd like to share this book. If you're interested in growing bulbs, you should get a copy of Garden Bulbs for the South by Scott Ogden. Excellent publication. I refer to it quite a bit. Um, and Matt's spot on with that guard, uh, gladiolus care. So thanks, Matt, excellent. Um, Matt, we're going to come back to you, Matt Lawler, uh, quickly uh, from a Zoom question. So we've got a mature landscape that used to be sunny and apparently is now shady. Should I move sunny plants to a shady area since the trees I have are now providing more shade? What do you think? Uh, so anytime you're going to move plants, you're going to run the risk of them dying. Um, yeah. But uh, the one thought I had on that one was... I mean, it, so if it, normally we run into the other issue of people cutting trees back too much and, yeah. and putting a, a plant that was growing happy in the shade uh, in a sunny spot and it gets sun spots and, and isn't too happy. Um, you certainly can move the plants to a shady area. Uh, they just might not produce the flowers that you're looking for or what you had when you had them in a sunny area. But uh, most plants are going to grow just fine in the shade. They're just going to grow a lot different than they grow in the sun if they're they're used to be growing in the sun so they're going to be leggier they're going to grow kind of taller and spread out and have bigger leaves and not as many leaves yeah that's good yeah this is like the exact worst time of the year to be doing this kind of stuff so if you can ask yeah, that's a good point yeah if you can wait uh or just leave them alone uh, like matt said that would be good uh wait till the winter time um so steven this can be just a, a one or two sentence thing um, what's your opinion on landscape fabric? Like, um, I can make it one or two words if you want it that way. And my quick right. one is no. Okay. <laughs> so so you, you've, you've um, given us the one word no. Give us the sentence why. Okay. Um, what, what we're looking at it seemed like a good idea when they first came out with it. The problem is it's labor intensive putting it down. There's other ways of managing weeds. You can do a lot of pre-management with a non-selective herbicide or something along that lines. Um, and once the matting's down, you're gonna eventually collect organic matter and soils on top of it, and the weeds are gonna grow right up on top of the matting and then into the matting, you gotta pull it. Other things like torpedo grass and others will pop right up through it. And so yeah. it, it seemed like it really was a great thing, but in the long run, it may be frustrating, especially if yeah. you're growing container plots uh, uh, near it and you got perennials in it or small trees, they'll shoot the roots right through it and you can't move the container except for cutting the fabric. Yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's good in theory, but in practice, not so good. So that's yeah. awesome. Well, folks, we are, uh, we're at 102. We're going to run a little bit over as uh, we apparently always do here, but <laughs> that's just because we have so much great content for you. So if you can stick around, uh, we're going to finish answering. We've got uh, eight or 10 more questions and we'll, we'll hit those. Uh, if not, we appreciate you joining in uh, and have a good rest of your day. I would like to remind everyone uh, before we close and uh, here in a little while to please take the quick survey that will accompany this uh, presentation. Um, and also be sure to tune in for our next uh, one of these Gardening in the Panhandle Lives. It will be on July the 9th in two weeks uh, on butterfly gardening. So with that, we're gonna keep moving on and answer a couple more questions before we get out of here. Um, so Matt Orwat, uh, Zoom question. When slash how often uh, should Confederate Jasmine be trimmed? Okay, uh, Confederate Jasmine. Well, what you need to do uh, is is that there's a great EDIS document that I, I put that uh, Beth's going to post, but what, you, what okay. you do is you trim it with as needed with hedge trimmers just to keep it from growing out of bounds. Don't pr prune too deep. So you when you trim with the hedge trimmers, make sure there are leaves left so don't prune it bare, okay? 
Okay. But hedge trimmers to keep it in bounds and on the, on the top and the sides, if you have it grown on a trellis, the same thing. However, don't put it in a sunny spot because it'll grow too wild. So in like shade, um, don't overwater or over fertilize because um, it'll grow too dense and develop really thick woody growth. So just trim it with hedge trimmers. If it gets woody and thick, sometimes it can play out and need to be, uh, it's a, it can be a, a chore to re, redo it, like uh, trim out big chunks of it. That's maybe once every 20 years or every 10, 20 years. But the, the, short, the short answer is hedge trimmers as needed as to keep it look aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, that's one of the most aggressive plants that we can grow. It's gorgeous. Doesn't have a lot of problems. Uh, consider it Florida friendly, but man, is it aggressive. So take the head shears to it. Yeah. It probably respond pretty well. Uh, Sheila, we're going to go back to our friend, the sago palm, which you told us was uh, a plant possibly to avoid. So we lost two sagos that are almost 20 years old and we're not sure why. What should we do? All right. And that, you know, would be a, a concern as to why was it just old age? Did it succumb to uh, some sort of insect infestation? Um, were they actually experiencing nutritional deficiencies? Because those are the most common issues. Uh, sago palms typically will live a very long time. So 20 years is not that old for a sago. Yeah. Uh, but if it gets stressed out from a nutritional deficiency, because they are not truly palms. You don't really look at them as uh, needing the same nutrients as you would other palms, but they can become minor element deficiency, particular um, manganese, M-N, not M-G. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't recognize that problem. Um, iron can be an issue, you know, those type of things. So that would be my concern is did it, actually fail because of nutritional deficiencies. Um, there are, are lots of EDIS publications um, that will outline some of these, and I know we've got one as a, as a link there, but otherwise general care on a SAGO, you're going to spend most of your time monitoring for pest problems. If that agent cycad scale shows up, you will be doing monthly oil treatments to the above ground foliage and then drenches or other organic treatments for the winter months um, for the males that overwinter in the root system. Um, it does become a lot of maintenance. Uh, there is no yeah. low general care for it anymore. Okay. So if you have a sago that, that plays out before its normal lifespan, and for sure 20 years is, is not the sago's normal lifespan, it's much longer. Um, you might have starved it to death uh, without, without fertilizer, or if, especially if there's not an obvious pest issue going on there. So. Right, yeah, and the pest would be obvious because it will look like it's been snowed on. You took yeah. some artificial canned snow and sprayed it. Flocked sagos are not normal, but nor are really pale or yeah. brown deformities in right. sagos. And some people just blame it in, on winter damage or you know, some other issue and just let it go too long. Yeah, and you let it go too long and they will eventually give up on you, so. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. So, Stephen, going back to you on uh, special needs of azaleas in full sun and sandy soils. Um, that goes back to the old term and discussion about right plant for right place. And yeah, um, this isn't exactly the right place. Uh, they, they do like that partial shade, the edge of woodlands where they're catching that right. afternoon shade and cooling them off and keep from stressing them. You, you've got to look at um, how am I developing the root system in there? Is, is it organic matter the way it should be and keeping that consistent, well-drained quote, moist soil, but not too wet. Um, there are a lot of yep. root rot issues with the plants. Um, if you're in full sun like that, um, it's, there's going to be a lot of stresses on it. Um, and lace bugs love it. When, when the plant stresses, they'll, they'll jump, and you'll yeah. see a lot of damage happening from the piercing and sucking on the back of the leaves. Um, the one thing about the lace bug, you also have to think about it, it has more than one life cycle. Um, right. So you'll, you'll have a big cycle and then kind of a medium-sized cycle that follows later into the season. So, yeah. um, gosh, with the full sun, I, I just don't know what to tell them on, on this part of it. It's, it's going to be a plant that's always going to give you a hard time or it's going to right. have a hard time in that setting. 
Um, yeah, I agree. You know, and these a lot of these new developments we see, you know, some of the dwarfs and encores just specked all over the place in, in full sun, and that's just a problem long term. So maybe start yep. thinking about a different plant. All yep. right. So we've got, uh, I want everybody just quickly to, we've got a question from Zoom. Quickly give me uh, your answer. So we've got the question, what are examples of some successful North Florida ornamental landscapes? So I interpreted this question as uh, just some, some places you could actually go see that we think give you examples of things to do uh, or not to do. So Sheila, uh, tell us a landscape that you think is, would be a good example for some folks to go ride through and look at. Well, and of course, uh, Stephen could certainly chime in on some more of the other details too, but uh, if you haven't been through the watercolor development in South Walton, they've done a really good job with not just natives, but also some of the low maintenance cultivar, uh, color, uh, water uh, runoff issues. I mean, they've done a really good management of all of that to keep it to somewhat minimal care. Yeah. Uh, watercolor in South Walton is a really good example of some of the right things to do without having to spend all your time in the yard. Okay. Matt Lawler, what's a, what's a garden or a landscape that you would suggest folks go take a look at? So uh, my thought on this one was the uh, Gardens of the Big Bend at the North Florida Research and Education Center in Quincy. Okay. Um, it's set up more like a botanical garden, but uh, they do have a, a nice uh, path that you can walk through and, and check out all the landscape plants that might not as be as high maintenance as uh, some of the other ones you'll see in other landscapes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Most of the stuff Dr. Knox has there can be successfully grown with pretty minimal care. Um, uh, Stephen, what, what's a, an example of a landscape or a garden um, that you would recommend folks try to take a look at? You know, I, I hate to fall back to what Sheila was talking about, but <laughs> okay. but um, there there are different phases out there um, in watercolor. So there's a lot of walking, you know, take some water, a little pack with you when you go, and maybe even a little snack. Because you yeah. can spend a lot of time and a lot of a lot of leg work out there. Okay. I'll tell you the first things that we actually discovered when we were walking through those woodland areas when it was just uh, timber road, uh, we had to catch a couple of rattlesnakes and relocate them because they're they're great at uh, uh, keeping down certain populations of animals that we have in Northwest Florida. But uh, there you go. when we looked when we looked at developing that runnel, um, that um, I affectionately called it the water trough. Um, yeah. But they, that one has a nice spill effect and cooling type sensation with it. We had to look at selecting a lot of trees and trying to keep, and that, that actually dictated where the turf areas were going. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's well worth looking at. Check out watercolor, folks. Very good. Yeah. Matt or what? Give us a, uh, give us a garden yeah. landscape to go check out. Uh, Alfred McClay Gardens and State Park in Tallahassee. Okay. I love that place for a winter garden, so what you can plant for winter flowering and what you can plant for shade gardening. That place is great for that. And another thing, they have an impressive turf there. So if you want to see some beautiful turf grass, there go you go. There. Okay. And uh, one of my favorite ways to find out uh, what plants do well, and I, I tell folks to do this all the time, is you know, just, just ride around and look at businesses, uh, gas stations, cemeteries, <laughs> don't get a lot of care. If the plants are doing well there, chances are you can be successful with them too. Um, so just just keep that in mind. Just check out some lower budget, low maintenance landscapes sometimes for for good planting ideas. Um, uh, there was a question on Zoom about care for peonies. I'm gonna take care of that real quick. Uh, we do not grow peonies in Northwest Florida. We can't grow peonies in Northwest Florida. Um, I went to a landscape one time in South Walton. The lady had brought her uh, 200 plus peony plant peony collection from Pennsylvania with her and planted them in her yard. And we're wondering uh, what was going on with them. They were they were pitiful and declining. Um, and that's just going to happen. So we can't grow those here. So the northern folks can't grow some of the things we can grow. We can't grow some of the things that, that they can grow. So just just grow what we can grow, I would say. So Sheila, we've got just a couple of questions left. Uh, this person has clay soil. What can they do to improve their soil without ripping everything out? Aerate, aerate, and aerate. Okay. Take a pitchfork, stab a bunch of holes in the ground around the plant. You may disturb a few roots, so what? Um, you're not going to devastate the overall growth of the plant. 
and then broadcast uh, a very light compost or even peat moss. Okay. Something along those lines that would fall back into those holes and improve that texture over time. Incorporating that little bit of organics that have some sand into them um, in small areas repeatedly is going to be your best bet to kind of break that up. That clay is just so tight. There's no air into those soils. We need to create spaces for the for the air and the water to, to make its way into the root system. Yeah, spot on. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so this is one of the first questions we got. The the client has uh, been been chatting with me on on uh, Zoom here, try, trying to get me to ask it. So we're finally to it from Zoom. I'm gonna let Matt or what uh, answer answer this. We have new sod put down a couple of months ago. It looks great, but I'm seeing Florida puzzly. Be uh -oh. Handle it. I've handpicked it. What to do? Well, let me tell you that for I love Florida puzzly. <laughs> it's uh -oh. a great native that that bees love to go to and get a nectar from. So it's a good bee plant, but okay. So if you want to get rid of it, if you don't want it in your grass, um, I have an EDIS document that I linked in our spreadsheet that Beth can post below. But with, um, with Florida Pusley, the best thing to do since it's an annual is to put out a pre-emergent, okay? Put out the pre-emergent. Um, and I believe that you'd want to put that out in the, in the fall, wouldn't you? Because it's a winter weed, wouldn't you say? No, 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 it's spring weed. So you put it's that out. In, okay, yeah, put that out in March then. Put out the pre-emergent in March. Yeah, I couldn't remember. I'm not looking yeah. at my little cheat sheet. So, um, and another thing to do with that, uh, pendimethalin would be good gallery. Another thing is if you have it in the lawn, you can use like the trimic herbicide on it. But here's be careful about using that in hot weather because, uh, first of all, it can burn uh, your grass in hot weather. And second of all, if it's a new grass, I wouldn't use any herbicide on a new grass because yeah. any new new sod will be prone to herbicide damage. So yeah. I would wait and do a spring pre-emergent in March. And then if you have problems after that, spot treat with a herbicide that's safe to use on your grass, such as the Trimec in the spring but not or fall, but not in hot weather. Yeah, it's kind of a nuanced question because the different species of turf yeah. respond different to species of to the turf. herbicides. Yep. So, so read the label. The Read the label and make sure the herbicide is safe to use on that turf grass. And the same goes for the pre-emergent and don't use weed and feed because it's, if you're putting out pre-emergent, you shouldn't put out fertilizer at the same time. Yeah, but for the nuanced but, question, you did a pretty good job there. Yeah, but ch check, check the EDIS document. Yeah, for sure. And if, if I can chime in just a little bit on yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Don't make it a calendar selection, please. Please look at temperatures. Yeah. We can reach the temperatures for germination as early as January. For sure. That's true. For that first week of the year that you're getting 65 to 70 all week long and put your product out then. Sometimes right. March is too late and it may, you know, by the book, That's it's true. the middle of February, but it depends on what part of Florida you're in. And us in, in Okaloosa County, it was the third week of January this, this year. So, I mean, it yeah. can make a big difference. If, if you miss that window, it doesn't do you much good. So, look at about the calendar yeah our and she was really right about that yeah our spring because, weather can be so variable so just the temperatures and yeah don't rely Depending on the where calendar. you are versus the coast to the to the okaloosa line up there near near um florala over there in walton or somewhere around there there's a big difference in our temperature yeah yeah depending on where they're at all right very good so uh, a zoom question for stephen greer uh this kind of goes to some stuff we've talked about already, but how to prevent weeds and flower beds? Just a general question here. Yeah, um, with the general type question, it's kind of hard to address because of not right. knowing the specific plants and are they annuals, perennials, those types of things. But uh, I mean, it kind of almost goes back more to like the fabric type, landscape fabric type question. Yeah. You know, you're looking at mulching and proper shading out of, of those areas, the density of the plantings that you're putting in, how quickly they come up and come into play and, and develop right. that shade and, lead, and basically shade out a lot of the annual pieces. I, I really am in favor of that. Um, yep. There's a good a lot to be said about exercise. So, you know, hands and knees and Pulling weeds is not a not a terrible thing. Make sure you wear your garden gloves when you do it, just for protection purposes and safety. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah. You know, there's there is, is an article uh, based in there uh, through the University of Florida IFAS site um, that deals directly with um, 
some of those decision processes on yeah. what you're doing with with planting beds and That's good. you're looking at initially if you're starting as non-selective chemical per usage um, such as glyphosate and some of the others um, like I mentioned composting and then you start looking at pre-emergent materials like they were just talking about in a turf situation you're also looking at in this planting bed areas you know some of the ron stars or pendimethalin or some of those okay yeah very good I, I will say that um I've been able to get away from pre-emergence in my landscape just by keeping a good mulch down now for five years or so in a row um, and then just spot spraying uh, the individual weeds that I miss or either just pulling them. So that's, yep. that's good. Perfect. Mulch is critical. Um, uh, Sheila, what to do about tall great myrtle trees losing their leaves before the fall? What can we do about that? Well, premature leaf drop definitely tells you there's an issue. So yeah. go back and look and see what's going on. Um, if it is experiencing extended droughts over our hot summer months, even though it's a drought tolerant plant that will stress it out enough that it could drop leaves prematurely. Look at those leaves closely. If it's the other extreme where we've been raining a whole lot, you can get premature leaf drop from circospora leaf spot, which is a foliar disease. Right. That can be addressed preventatively, not curatively, but preventatively if you see those environmental conditions occurring again. If it's not one of those two weather related issues, my next question would be, when are you fertilizing? Because remember that energy that that plant took to do all that flowering over the summer has taken a lot of reserve away from that plant. And if you haven't given it another light fertilizing as it finishes blooming, it will begin the senescence process very early. Yeah. So I don't know which one to consider without evaluating it, but premature drop says one of those three things is going wrong and you'll have to check out which one you think it is in your situation. Yep, you got a problem. So uh, check out your uh, local extension office and ask ask your agents, um, and we come take a look at it or or send us some pictures and things like that, so we can make a better diagnosis. Very good. Um, our actually our last official question here from Zoom. Um, this is from Matt Lawler. I have some black spots on plum tree leaves, and uh, also on my persimmon tree, a flaky white parasite. So tell us what we can do about this. Okay, so. Um Plums and peaches and apples are prone to pretty much any disease in this part of the country. Um, so Beth's going to post uh, an article or a publication from UGA and it goes through each of the different diseases that peach trees can get, uh, which should cover anything that a prune tree will get. Um, the first few that come to mind would be either fire blight, um, and the, or uh, canker or scab. So those are three of the main ones that we see in peaches and plums. Um, you know, the main, main issue or the, the, the best thing that can help with keeping disease out of peaches and plum trees would be a good pruning. Um, you wanna have what they call an open vase. Um, so you're cleaning out anything that's on the interior part of the tree and you're promoting kind of just a, a wide tree structure, not a central leader like we normally would see on you know, pretty much any tree uh, that we see in the landscape where it's got one main trunk. Uh, we're pushing the trunks out and promoting um, a better airflow through the tree that way. Uh, it's also important not to have any overhead irrigation on a plum tree. Uh, with the persimmon, the first thing I thought of were lichens, um, yeah, which sure. aren't really going to cause any harm at all. They're there because they're taking advantage of the light that's penetrating through the tree. So the persimmon might be unhealthy for some other reason, maybe a nutrient deficiency, uh, maybe a disease. Um, persimmons don't have a lot of issues, uh, but they, uh, they do like um, to have, you know, a moist, well-drained soil. So it might not be getting enough um, water. It might be sitting in too much water. Um, the other issue with persimmons uh, that's common that would cause kind of a white um, substance would be uh, botrytis. Um, so uh, with any of these disease issues, uh, if you're not able to fix them with pruning the trees, um, or if you're seeing the, the issue persist, um, you want, might just want to get a product that contains chlorothalonil. That's probably the, the best 
broad spectrum of fungicide that we see for homeowners. Uh, Dacanil is the, the brand that I always see. I'm not pushing that brand. You can get pretty <laughs> much any brand um, of chlorothalonil. It's, it's been around for a long time. Um, and then uh, any of the copper products, so um, copper uh, sulfate um, or copper hydroxide might help with gotcha. some of these issues. Okay, very good. So definitely follow some of those, uh, those pruning practices on those plums and uh, if you do have a lichen issue, um, you may not have a problem at all. So check that out. We actually had a couple of questions asked in the Q&A here, and I'll, I'll throw those out there. Uh, first is to Sheila, a uh, lady has a Gulf Fritillary eating her passion vine. What to do? That's a common one. All right. Well, enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is a host plant for the Gulf Fritillary. Um, they do need that plant in order to be able to lay their eggs because that is the primary food source for the caterpillars when they hatch. Yep. Uh, so you will have your plant devastated pretty significantly when you have that caterpillar population. Um, you can deter them a little bit by giving them other food sources, which would be like parsley and fennel. Um, but for the most part, let it run its course. You'll have a new batch of Gulf Fritillaries cut your uh, passion vine back, it'll grow by back next year, no problem whatsoever. It's yeah. unsightly, I know, but it's, it is what that planet and uh, butterfly are meant to do. Yep, so the ultimate goal of the, the Gulf Fritillary, uh, or the, the passion vine is to, to, have, to feed Gulf Fritillaries um, uh, and, and to have flowers and you can do both there, so very good. So next one, uh, will mosquito treatments hurt frogs? So Sheila, I'm just gonna keep, since we're with you, keep you on this one. Um, typically, and, and I don't know which mosquito treatment they're talking about. I if believe we're talking, talking about dunks and sprinkles. Okay, if they are using the BT formulation that yeah. is meant for uh, the larvicides, it will not impact um, aquatic vertebrates. So the fish, the frogs, the salamanders, everybody is good. It will not do anything to them. It is meant to shut down the gut system of the larvae, which is kind of like a small worm, um, of the mosquitoes. And that's the only thing it'll do. Yeah, so very good. So I appreciate you folks that, uh, for hanging in with us to the end. That's, uh, we're pushing up here against 1.30, so we're gonna go ahead and finish up. Another reminder, you're gonna be prompted uh, at the end of the survey or at the end of <laughs> the session here to answer a survey via email. Uh, we would appreciate it very much if you would do that. Uh, it helps us kind of guide our programming and lets us know uh, if we're doing a good job and if you learned anything today, hopefully you did. Um, I appreciate all of our panelists for being on. Um, and remember to tune in with us in two Thursdays. So on July the 9th, not next Thursday, but the next July the 9th um, for butterfly gardening. And we're gonna have some another excellent group of panelists on that. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and so for Daniel Littard, the county extension agent here in Calhoun County, Sheila Dunning, Matt Lawler, uh, Stephen Greer, Matt Orwatt, Beth Bowles, and Julie McConnell, our team here at Gardening in the Panhandle Live, uh, we'll sign off and y'all have a good afternoon. <laughs>